Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Lisa McCown from Beyond Clean. Today has been such an incredible day of learning and thought-provoking discussions. Thank you all for being engaged with today's presentations and speakers. As a reminder, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll find many downloadable documents that have been provided for you by our event sponsor and speakers. You'll also find bonus CE content provided for you by Beyond Clean. Brenda Doran is the manager of epidemiology at Scripps Memorial Hospital. She is also a professor of biological sciences. With over 10 years of experience working in infection prevention and control, Brenna is passionate about collaborating with perioperative and sterile processing professionals to develop best practices with patient safety in mind. She has a PhD in public health and is dedicated to keeping healthcare professionals safe in the world of COVID-19. It's no secret in the relationship between infection control and sterile processing is a match made in patient safety ha heaven. Knowing as best friends in the disinfection world, these departments are so entwined, one cannot exist without the other. Today, Brenna is here to outline the benefits a strong friendship between infection control and sterile processing can have on the safety of patients and the success of your SPD. She will also take a deep dive into the role each of these departments has on the prevention of healthcare related infections. So please join me in welcoming Brenna Doran. All right, Brenna. Thank you so much for that really warm introduction. Um, I'm gonna apologize in advance and say that I'm having some technical issues that were kind of unexpected. Um, so we are going to do our best to navigate through it. With that said, I just wanna thank everybody uh, for taking the time today out of their busy Saturday schedules to be part of me with that, this presentation. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I do not have any financial disclosures and I also um, wanted to share a little bit about my background. Um, so I am presently the manager of uh, epidemiology at Scripps Memorial Hospital in La Jolla. And as an infection preventionist, I do have what is considered to be um, a bit of an atypical background. Um, when I started to explore the role of infection control about 12 years ago, um, I was a clinical microbiologist at a pediatric hospital. So I had a bachelor's degree in biology. And at the time I worked the bench and I was playing with viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungus, um, really just trying to identify what causative agents were making our patients sick. Um, in the nine years I spent in that role, um, I really started to become interested into kind of why the patients were getting sick with what they were, you know, kind of what was happening at a more population base level. And so I was fortunate in that working in a hospital setting, I was in contact with our infection control department and they share a little bit about what they did. Um, and through those initial conversations, I, I really started to get interested on what that disease path looked at from a population level. Um, so you know, during that time as a microbiologist, I went and got my master's degree in education and started teaching at the college level. Um, but because of this kind of newfound love about population-based infections, I decided to go ahead and pursue a doctorate degree in public health epidemiology. Um, so at the time that I was doing this about 12 years ago, um, generally infection preventionists were nurses. But I was really fortunate in that during this time, there was really kind of more engagement about getting people from other disciplines to work in the environment. Um, but, you know, when I did begin a role as an infection preventionist, I did not have that clinical background that a lot of my fellow IPs had. 
So what was kind of beautiful about that is I am naturally inquisitive by nature, and I like to learn. And so it really kind of afforded me a space to really kind of get a better sense of what was going on in the clinical space, um, but also to understand um, really how I could grow as an IT. So really during that time is I was fortunate enough to really get involved with various different departments. Um, and over the last 10 years, almost 11 years now, I've been working as an infection preventionist. Really what I have grown to truly love is the periop world. And the department that first introduced me to the periop world is sterile processing. And so I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit with you about my experience or evolution, if you will, of being an IT um, and my role in the periop SPD environment. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so learning and objectives for this, there's a few things I'd like to kind of go over. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about, about um, kind of some of the things that infection control looks at through our lens. So kind of sharing with you what we're looking at as we're traveling through the environment. I'd like to share a real example of a never event. Um, and what that event was, was an unsterilized tray being used on a patient in an hospital. Unsterilized tray being Yes, in an operative suite. And then also um, talk about, kind of recount. Are you able to hear me okay or waking up? Okay, so re recount two processes. Hello? You're good to go. So else, okay, am I? Oh, great. Yep. Sorry, I'm having all sorts of weird stuff going on here. Um, so recount to um, examples of what kind of what happened that led to that event. And then also talk about the infection control role in the investigative process. Um, how infection control is involved in kind of that um, corrective action plan. And then ultimately, and really I think kind of most importantly, how do you leverage your infection control department um, to really kind of be a partner and, a, and an advocate for you in the sterile processing space? Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Um, so really what that looks like when we look at it from kind of a macroscopic perspective is one of the primary tenants of infection control is that infection control lens. And so what I mean when I talk about that is when we start down the journey of learning about infection control, really what the focus is, is what is it that causes people to get sick? Um, what is it that puts people at risk? And when we are going about our day-to-day -day business rounding, we're really looking through kind of a lens that we've cultivated. And the primary tenet of that lens, next slide is. What is it that causes people to get sick? So I'm. What is it that people at risk? Perfect. Um, so really what that looks like from an infection control point of view is what's called a chain of infection. Um, so if we're looking at that chain of infection slide, really what you see is a circle. And there's kind of various elements there and they're all connected by a chain. And so again, one of those primary tenets of infection prevention is these are the series of events that have to occur uninterrupted in order for an infection to occur. So we always start off with some sort of opportunistic pathogen. So that would be on the top. And if we look at this going in a clockwise fashion, the next piece would be an environmental reservoir. So essentially what that means is where does the pathogen live in its regular life? From there, we're looking at port of exit so how does that pathogen leave from its environment into a space where it could potentially make people sick? From there, we're looking at mode of transmission. So i.e., how does that pathogen move from its environment um, to a space where it's able to infect somebody? Then we look at port of entry. So if we think about infections, we think about how pathogens kind of get into us, right? Whether we ingest them, they get into a wound, 
um, we're inhaling them. Um, that final piece will be susceptibility of host. So basically how robust is our immune system? So depending on how robust our immune system is will also indicate whether or not we get sick. So from that infection prevention perspective, we're really looking at each of these elements and how do we actively help support breaking those chains of infection. So if I'm looking at this from a sterile processing perspective, when we're actually doing those audit tools or doing those rounds of sterile processing, what we're focusing on is that environmental reservoir for infection and then also port of exit and mode of transmission. Um, so if we advance to the next slide, a lot of our initial work as infection preventionists is doing what we like to kind of affectionately call audit or rounds. And so there's really two main components in that that we're looking at. One is the overall environmental pieces. So that would be the physical environment. So we're actually assessing the physical environment of the sterile processing department through that infection control lens. The next piece would be processes and procedures. So ultimately, what are the processes and procedures occurring in sterile processing, which could take that reservoir of pathogen, right, which would be the environmental place, and then have it get to a point where it could end up in instrumentation and potentially infect a patient. Next slide, please. So when we're first looking at the physical environment, really what we're doing is not only assessing um, the space as a whole, but we're looking for kind of specific things. One, are we looking for a, uh, we're looking for that environmental reservoir. So are we observing any sort of observable evidence that there might be some sort of pathogens you know, in the environment? Um, the other piece we're looking at, is there any breakdowns in the environment, such as repairs that need to happen, leaks, those sort of things, which would encourage those pathogens from um, having nice, friendly places to live. So if we take a look at this picture here, on the top right of it, you see kind of some stained ceiling tiles. So from an infection prevention perspective, kind of some things that are going through my head when I'm seeing this is, is the ceiling tile wet? Is it dry? Um, did it recently rain? Is there possibly a leak going on above the ceiling? Um, so those kind of things are being put through kind of a filter, if you will, and I'm essentially taking what I'm observing in the environment and I'm assessing what is the relative risk of what I'm seeing ultimately causing some sort of patient harm. Now, what you can't really see in this picture is directly underneath that ceiling tile is actually an HVAC vent, um, which is blowing air into the department. So depending on kind of some of those other factors, you know, whether or not we've had any sort of reports of fungal infections with patients, or we know that there's an issue with our HVAC system, just looking at the singular ceiling tile as alone, it's not, you know, super high risk to patient care. However, it's very much on my radar and I'd likely like to get that ceiling tile replaced as soon as possible. Now, if we look at the picture directly underneath it, there's some lovely black mold on a wall. So once mold turns into a, a lovely black color, it's mature enough to release spores into the environment. So that's something that as infection control, we don't ever want to see in a physical environment. But again, I need to put that through that infection control lens and ask myself some really kind of important questions. Where is this moldy wall in relation inside of sterile processes? Is it in the back of a storage room where we're just storing disinfectants? Or is it kind of something more serious? Are we seeing it next to the clean side um, where we're processing instrumentation? So again, observations by themselves, we really wanna put that through that filter and ask ourselves, what is the relative risk of what we're seeing ultimately causing uh, patient harm? Now, aside from those environmental reservoirs, the other things we're looking at, again, is the condition of the environment. So what's the ability for these pathogens to kind of live inside of things? So if we look like directly underneath that, what we're seeing is a broken or torn chair. Um, so when a chair is broken, that makes it very hard to clean it, right? And then penetrations in the wall. So these are all things we're kind of looking at um, overall. So if we go to the next slide, you know, you ask yourself, why do we care if something's damaged? Why is that important to infection control? You know, why do they, um, you know, kind of bug us or why do they care so much about when the laminates come in off the counter? 
Um, and the reason for that is is kind of back to that chain of infection. So when you have damage to a surface, um, if you look at this picture here of this counter, um, some of the laminates missing, there's some holes in it. It's really hard to effectively clean that counter. And then there is likely, because there are crevices inside of those holes, potential pathogens that are there. Um, so depending on what's happening on this counter, um, there could potentially be some impact to patient harm. Um, so if we have a counter that has you know, debris inside of it, um, there are pathogens, we are processing, you know, packing our clean instruments on top of a counter that's broken, um, there is a possibility that those pathogens from that pocket can somehow or another end up into the instrumentation. Um, so really twofold is kind of what's happening on this counter, what's the relative risk to patient, but ultimately how are we cleaning it? Um, is it something that's cleanable? So if we advance to the next slide, um, so another thing you've probably noticed with your infection control people is we're super interested about how clean something is. Um, so really the, the tenet of that is that, you know, something cannot be effectively disinfected if it's not clean. And so really what that means is that you're not really able to effectively remove microbial contamination or pathogens from an environment if it's not clean. So basically disinfecting dirt isn't really super helpful. You need to get all of that soil off of the environment and then effectively disinfect it. And so really what we're looking at when we think about cleanliness, what we're looking at when we think cleanliness is the environment and then effectively disinfect So what we're looking at when we're looking at um, this cleanliness is, you know, do we see dust on vertical so or horizontal? Really, what we're looking at. We think about cleanliness. So other things we're looking at is, you know, what we well, dust on vertical. Brenna, if you want to mute your webcam, then I think that echo will go away. Is that better? Is that yes, better? go ahead. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. I think I finally got the video piece working here. Thank you so much. I think I finally got the video piece working here. Thank you so much. I think I finally got the video piece working here. Thank you so much. I think I finally got the video piece working here. Thank you so much. I think I finally got the video piece Brenna, I think if we just continue with audio and you can go ahead and um, mute your yeah. webcam, we can just keep going. Okay, let's try doing that. I'm so sorry. Okay, so I'm muted on audio, so I'm going to keep going and please let me know if there's any more echo. Um, so, okay, we're, so, I'm muted on so we're also looking for audio, dust bunnies so or other it. creatures. Please let me know oh, if there's any more echo. Um, gunk or dirt and oh, dry so spills. I'm muted. So we're also looking for... Yeah. And the okay, reason why we're looking for these things is we're looking at how effective our overall cleanliness processes are. So when we see these things, you know, dust bunnies, dirt, dust, what that tells us is that our cleaning processes within this high-risk sterile processing environment are not effective. Um, and we probably dig into that a little bit more. Dunk or dirt and dry. 
And if you'd be able to advance my slide, please. Okay. So when we look at processes and procedures, really kind of what we're looking at is we are kind of migrating away from that and those potential reservoirs for environmental contamination. And we're looking at the ability or the possibility of those pathogens migrating. Um, and the reality is, is that pathogens migrate um, on people. And so we're looking at such things as, you know, the overall um, cleanliness of the staff. Are they wearing the hospital issue scrubs? Are those scrubs clean? Are we using uh, PPE appropriately? And are we following those processes? And again, the thought process behind this is, is that if you are in contact with an environmental reservoir for pathogens, what ends up happening is those can get contaminated on your clothing, and then that clothing can contaminate the processing that you're working with. And so, really, when we're thinking about your know, PPE, is your body protected? Are you protecting your scrubs? Are those scrubs clean? Um, so these are all things that we're kind of looking at as we're walking around the department doing our audits. Um, the other thing that we're really looking at is what are the overall processes? And again, we're looking at that from an infection control lens. And so really kind of what that is is, you know, what's the hand hygiene process look like? Um, are the staff performing high hygiene? hand hygiene from dirty to clean tasks? Are we doing a great job at physically delineating um, kind of our clean and dirty processes? So again, from that infection control chain and infection perspective, what that means is really what is the risk or the possibility of these potential pathogens um, contaminating the work being done by the staff? Um, and so really kind of where we go from there, if we can go down to the next slide, is, is really focusing on that decontamination piece. So we've kind of done an overall environmental tour. We're, we've kind of checked out the staff, looking at PPE. Um, but when we're looking at processes, really what we're looking at is have we, you know, followed those AME ARON standards? So we start, you know, from the case cart all the way through the decontamination process. And ideally, while we're down there doing our rounds, we have a chance to kind of see the whole process as a whole. So we're looking at, you know, did the OR do a great job using their um, enzymatic sprayer spraying down those instrumentations? Um, is, was the gross contamination removed? Um, when we are observing the staff through the decontamination process, you know, was each instrument um, broken down to its small, smallest components where the hinge is open, was each and every one of those cleaned? Um, and again, from that infection control perspective, we're thinking about environment or um, environmental reservoirs for infection and those abilities to transmit to patient care. Um, so when the instruments are placed in the washer, again, are the hinges open, organized, and for optimal exposure? Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, what we're looking for here is when we're on the other piece of this, um, on the clean side, is, you know, what does the packaging instrumentation look like um, when we're completing it from packaging to sterilization? Do we see that clear physical delineation between where instruments are placed prior to being sterilized and where they're being placed after they're sterilized? What is the process to record um, what step in the process the trays are in? Um, and then ultimately, how does sterile processing track each, pray, each tray from decontamination through sterilization? Um, so these are all just, again, kind of very broad 30,000 foot views on what infection control looks at. Um, but something I do kind of just want to bring back is infection control doesn't generally have a really thorough understanding of the day-to-day -day kind of intimate details of what you guys are doing. So when we're doing these evaluations, these observations, they're very much from that 30,000 foot level. So if we go on to the next slide to sterilization, again, this is kind of us closing that proverbial look and seeing the end product of the work. 
Um, so things that we're looking for, again, kind of following those aiming arrow and standards is, you know, are the hinges open? Are the tips protected? Um, how do our um, indicators look? Are they sterile? So if you look at this picture here, I kind of showed a couple of examples of things I have found um, as an IP. So this top left folder, you know, the hinges are open, that looks good. However, I don't know if you can see it so much in the slide, but there is actually some brown discoloration going on inside of the pill pack. Um, so questions is, you know, kind of what's going on here, what happened. Um, and then if you look at the piece on the very bottom, you can see that there's some black. So maybe the Sharpie inside of it um, kind of bled. The um, hinges are also not open. There's no tip protector on the end of that. So these are things that I pulled out of actual OR storage. Um, so as part of our, you know, rounding, again, we're looking at things from that very macroscopic view, and we're looking to see how processes were followed in regards to any or air and standards. And when we see deviations or variations in that, really what we are looking for is, is how, how well are we following our standards. And when there are discordances, again, going back to that chain of infection, what is the relative risk to the patient? Um, so finally, the slide here about sterile storage. Um, so really, when we're looking at sterile storage situations, you know, are we following our policies? Are we following best standards? Um, so most of the hospitals I've worked at, and I believe kind of the predominant uh, methodology here is event-related sterility. So again, looking at that through that infection control lens, how clean is the environment? Is there any sort of physical damage going on? Um, are we clearly delineating clean from dirty? Um, so what you can see here in this picture is we have some corrugated boxes on top of our shelf of sterile storage. Um, and if we take kind of a closer look underneath that cover, we also have some boxes of gloves um, on top of some of our soft packs. So right here would be potential contamination of the outside of not only the instrumentation and the packaging, um, but also, you know, if you have weighted things on top of those soft packs that could compromise the integrity of the um, soft pack as a whole and possibly compromise the instrumentation. So circling back to cleanliness, something that we see a lot of in infection control um, and we probably bug you about is, you know, are the vents clean? Is the shelving free of debris? Again, that physical delineation. Um, and what's kind of happening now in a lot of hospitals is that there isn't space to store everything. Um, so when we're looking at the overall structure of sterile storage, are we really doing a good job maintaining that integrity, uh, kind of that bubble, if you will, around our sterile supplies to make sure that they are safe and they're not being placed in a kind of environmental or situation where their integrity can be compromised. So if we go on to the next slide, um, I do want to kind of go over um, a situation that I um, was involved in. So I worked at a hospital many years ago, um, and there was a situation where there was a non-sterile tray identified having been used um, in a operative suite on a patient. Um, so really, when we're looking at those risk assessments um, as a round as a whole, as I kind of alluded through, we are kind of looking at what we observed. We're kind of throwing it through that filter of relative risk. And then ultimately the report you get from us is going to kind of be stratified or what we call a risk assess. So we'll kind of share with you the things that we believe are kind of most at risk for patient harm or could cause patient harm. But we're not necessarily going to put, you know, every single thing that we see on there. Really the idea of doing these rounds and conducting a risk assessment is to kind of give you a sense um, what sort of things could put patients at risk and things that you might want to work on. And I will circle back at that on the end and kind of how infection control can help as a, um, an advocate and a partner to kind of help with some of those things. So an example here of a real life event that happened um, on that unsterilized tray. So what had happened is um, it was identified as the SPD team in decontamination were breaking apart a tray that the indicators inside of it um, did not show positive. Um, so, you know, for those of you who work in sterile processing, 
one of the indicators that you use to ensure the inside of a tray has been appropriately sterilized is those indicators. Um, for those of us outside of SPD, um, whether we're looking at peel packs or, or even the trays themselves, there are external indicators that help us identify whether or not this particular pill pack, soft pack, or tray has been successfully sterilized. Um, so the staff is great. They notice as they were breaking down this tray that the um, integrators inside of it did not have any reaction. Um, so the immediate concern is that there was not, um, this tray was not sterilized. Um, so they went ahead and brought in their SPD leadership. Um, they looked at the tray, they went over it. Um, they then went ahead and called the OR um, to see whether or not they had um, observed the external indicator um, of the tray had been sterilized. Um, so at that point in time, we were not able um, to confirm whether or not this tray had been sterilized or not. Um, so at that point, we started um, what is called a investigation. So we really wanted to ascertain whether or not an event had occurred or not. So we did the tray of the audit. Again, we were kind of unable to um, identify from kind of those external indicators. Um, so what we do have, which is a great process in sterile processing, is they do actually scan um, the instrumentation, the trays, as they go through the decon and clean and then ultimately sterilization process to identify whether or not each step had been completed. So when we did the computer audit of this particular tray, um, we were unable to validate or confirm that it had completed that sterilization step. So at this point, we kind of have two indicators letting us know that perhaps this tray had not been, had not been um, appropriately sterilized. So at that point, um, there's a phone call that happens to infection control um, letting us know that this situation may have occurred and that they kind of need um, our involvement in kind of digging into this a little bit further. Um, so from an infection control perspective, as we kind of already talked about, we focus a lot on that chain of infection. So from our perspective, there's two pieces here. One is kind of what actually happened with the tray. And then if there was a unsterilized tray used on a patient, what is the relative risk to patient harm? Um, so there's two sides of this that we were looking for um, and looking at. So the first thing we did is we assembled our key stakeholders um, really to kind of have a conversation. Um, so there is, you know, multiple people at the table. Um, we had an opportunity to kind of sit down hear from the various departments, kind of their series of events, what their recollection was, and then we kind of decided a plan on how we were gonna kind of investigate this. Um, so in the sterile processing department, there were multiple um, staff members that were involved in various steps. Um, so we interviewed them, we interviewed the OR, um, we took a look at the audit tool. Um, so step one of that, if we can go to that slide, is really kind of, again, starting that investigative process. So what kind of made this interesting was that we were not getting a lot of clarity, a lot of kind of consensus in what people experienced was on the stay with this patient. Um, and so we were able to confirm that there was an unsterilized tray um, and a total of two instruments had been used during the surgical procedure. But what made this kind of interesting is that when we interviewed the staff, both the sterile processing and the OR staff, they both, you know, went through their normal process. They did their external checks, and nobody identified that this tray had not been sterilized. Um, so there was, you know, risk if the, you know, potential instruments that were used may have been contaminated. So that was kind of defining the problem. Um, so step two here in this root cause analysis was determining whether or not there was a causal relationship. And so as we kind of already mentioned a little bit is, you know, doing that, those investigations. So one of the external um, indicators of a tray being sterilized is actually that clip um, that goes outside of the tray. And when it is unsterilized, um, you know, it is one color, and once it finishes the sterilization process, 
it turns to another color. And so when we talk to both the sterile processing and the OR staff, their recollection when they pulled the case, when they validated the case cart, when the OR staff was actually taking that into the room, is that that in external indicator had turned colors. Um, so from their perspective, there was no sort of external visual indicator that there was any sort of concern with that tray. Um, so again, we did the interviews. We were unable to kind of get any sort of clarity of what, what was actually happening. And so what we ended up actually doing um, was going through the security footage of the sterile processing department actually following that tray in question. Um, and so what kind of made that a really great course of action is that we were actually able to not only look at the environment, check the workflow, um, really have a chance to look at the, the actual condition of the sterile processing and, and conduct a really thorough um, risk assessment. So what we ultimately identified is that the, um, the, the tray itself, uh, there were some process failures that had occurred. So if we go to the next step, next slide, we're going to talk about the two primary process gaps that occurred that ultimately led to the sterilized tray um, being used in the operating room. Um, so I think what kind of happens a lot when there are process failures in sterile processing is it's really kind of a culmination of that proverbial perfect storm. Um, sterile processing has a large volume of instrumentation that they need to process. You know, the ORs flow ebbs and flows during the course of the day. Um, people, you know, call out sick, so sometimes sterile processing has to work with, you know, less than ideal staffing levels. And these things are, are kind of just kind of the natural flow of the department. Um, but sometimes when these sort of things occur, what the result is, again, is kind of that proverbial storm. Um, so upon kind of investigation of this, what we noted is the, one of the staff members had mistakenly moved a tray that was ready to go into the autoclave to a table um, where the already sterilized trays go. Um, and then the other major piece that we noted that was missing is that the staff member did not complete the scanning of the step of that tray, identifying that it had been um, successfully sterilized. So there was kind of a missed scanning opportunity there and then also that tray was placed into the, um, the wrong table. And so again, you know, kind of a benefit of infection control coming into a department, not even just doing kind of those audits and those rounds, but also from an investigative perspective is we really do have outside eyes. Um, so really kind of what I mean by that is, again, we're looking at things through our infection control lens. And so we're gonna see things a little bit differently um, than the people inside the department. It's kind of like how when, um, you know, you, you do something and someone else looks at it and notices something that you missed. So it's not that SPD wasn't doing everything correct. It's just that we have a different perspective by coming in. Um, and really what our goal is, is to really bring those outside eyes and help kind of expand that lens of the situation and kind of look at it from different ways. And when we do that collaboratively, we're really having an opportunity to bring each of our individual expertise and those lenses together and, and really kind of something beautiful happens when that happens. So step three here is identify um, effective solutions. So some of the things that infection control recommended was really kind of more clearly physically delineating the clean and the sterilized parts of the department. Um, so our SPD at the time, just like many others, you know, we have to do best with the physical space provided. Um, so really what we were able to do is we identified some distinctive labeling to the table in each area and really, really, truly physically delineated with them. Um, we also added a red line um, between the clean and the sterilized sides of the department. Um, again, just kind of as a visual indicator when people were going from one side to another that you're entering a different space. Um, so we really looked at it from a multifactorial perspective. And then when we looked at the um, kind of the overall training is we really took time um, and retrained staff on workflows. Um, so there was a lot of really, really beautiful collaboration between our SPD educator, you know, SPD leadership, perioperative leadership, infection control, 
And so we were all very much involved in all these processes, you know, working at it collaboratively as a team. Um, the next piece we looked at was the surgical aspect tracking team. Um, so really, you know, we kind of updated that system process to ensure that each of the staff members um, was unable to move forward um, without completing that scan. So, we, you know, you kind of call that a hard stop. So before, you know, they were able to kind of move past it if there was an issue or um, whatnot. But this time there was a hard stop. So the tech wasn't actually able to continue without resolving that issue. Um, we also looked at the locations of those workstations or those WOWs to better meet workflows. So one of the things we identified as part of the reason why there was, um, the reason why that, that particular tray didn't get scanned is because the staff members would have to walk from the workstation back to the table. And so sometimes um, when there was an issue, they, they didn't recognize it because of the way that the alarms would go off. So having that in closer proximity allowed the um, tech to identify it in real time. Um, and then also, you know, we provided kind of some oversight. So the sterile processing supervisors check the compliance of the report daily um, to kind of provide oversight, um, not in a punitive kind of way, but just is this process working? Um, again, just really collaboratively. So if there was an issue, there was communication between the SPD techs and the SPD leadership. And then finally, step four, you know, how do we implement and track our solutions? So the updated workflow for SPD staff, you know, they were trained on the new process. They were run through it. It was all very hands-on. Um, the education department did a really great job of kind of talking through each of the staff members, explaining the situation, why we were doing it. Infection control was there. We were able to kind of provide some input and some context to it. Um, and so, you know, another piece is updating those, those initial and annual competencies um, so that the situation, you know, not only was resolved, but also we provided a mechanism to ensure that it was, you know, kind of reinforced yearly and when we had new staff members. And then we increased our surveillance processes. So sterile processing started, tra you know, pulling tracking logs to make sure that everything looked good. If there was issues, they were able to troubleshoot it. Um, infection control, we increased our, our um, surveillance for surgical site infections during that time. Um, and then infection control and SPD, we increased kind of that joint rounding um, from about every six months to monthly. Um, and then honestly, kind of something beautiful, um, I think for both sides really kind of happened um, kind of as a result of the situation. Um, so next slide is kind of infection control and SPD. Um, BFFs forever. Um, and so really what I want to, you know, kind of end this with is really focusing on how to leverage infection control as a partner and advocate. And I had an opportunity to hear kind of the pre-conference um, conversation about this, um, this conference last night. And the discussion really kind of talks a lot about my presentation. So, you know, there's some great questions about whether or not infection control wants to be involved, whether or not we, we want to be partners, how open are we are to questions and conversation. And um, if we could advance to that next slide. Um, what I can say is that I haven't met an infection preventionist who will say no if you ask for help or who isn't interested in asking questions. Um, I also haven't met an infection preventionist who hasn't gone into the role because we are super passionate about patient safety and wanting to do our best kind of from our kind of ancillary perspectives to help other departments. And so really kind of the beauty of the SPD and the Infection Control Partnership is that both departments really have such a high level of knowledge and expertise. Um, so there's really a lot that both sides to contribute. Um, and then, in the, you know, I kind of started with, as my, as I started infection control, you know, I, I learned about that chain of infection. I understood things about how the physical environment could you know, increase possible pathogens in the space. And I understand how those can get contaminated from point A to point B. Um, so again, very macroscopic. Um, but SPD, the expertise in that department is really logistical and operational knowledge of how these things actually get done. Um, and then when you have an opportunity to, again, start forging that, that partnership and that collaboration, then there's able to be kind of a discussion and conversation about what the limitations or the barriers are on the SPD side, and then recommendations or support from infection control on really kind of how to break down those barriers. 
Um, so really, you know, also there's education inside. So instead of infection control coming in for our, you know, maybe biannual, um, potentially monthly rounds, you know, looking at a seeing ceiling tile, now SPD has an understanding of why that ceiling tile shouldn't be there and can replace it. Or if they see that there's, you know, peeling happening on the laminate of their counter, they recognize that that could be a risk and they put that ticket in earlier. So really the infection control knowledge and, and, and collaboration that happens to SPD helps them advocate for themselves because now they understand and are aware of the implications of some of these things and how it can cause um, potential risks to um, patient safety. So sterile processing alone, again, great resource. They, they are responsible for ensuring all of the instrumentations are in good condition, you know, do not need to be repaired, they're free of bio burden, and they're safe for patients. Um, so together, we're really able to kind of have a flow of knowledge back and forth um, and really kind of get a better understanding of what each other do. Um, and then also, you know, really both departments. I haven't met an SPD person um, that doesn't care about patients. I haven't met an SPD person that isn't, you know, really, really focused on doing their best job possible and keeping those patients safe. So we have a, a really more things in common um, than, than we have different. And so I think it's kind of just a natural partnership um, that can occur. Um, so kind of building on that, next slide, the building of an advocate. Um, so things that you can do is, you know, infection control appreciates that not everybody, you know, wants this in our department, not everybody loves them or they're doing rounds and audits, and also doesn't really understand what our role is. And we understand that sometimes we can be perceived as kind of investigating to get somebody in trouble or... Also, we can be, um, you know, kind of, kind of that gotcha mentality, which we really, really don't want. We're really there to support. Um, so invite your infection control team into your department and ask them questions. Um, you know, teach them if there's opportunity and both sides are open to it, teach them about the work in SPD and share some of those complexities. I really didn't have a thorough understanding of the complexity of SPD until, until I had the time and was given the invitation to actually learn some of those decontamination processes. Um, so it was really when I was actively decontamination and cleaning instrumentation myself with that brush, um, when I really started to get an understanding of really what that SPD role was. And that really was really powerful to me. Um, because now I'm a partner, now I'm an advocate, now I'm kind of seeing and experiencing some of the barriers that they experience. And if you have somebody in your sterile processing department that's interested in infection control, you know, maybe they'd like to spend a little bit of time or being the point person doing those roundings to ask those questions. Um, another advantage of infection control is aside from kind of that infection control lens and that chain of infection mentality is we also do have um, a fair amount of knowledge and the various regulatory um, requirements needed for the department. So while you're preparing for your joint commission or your other accrediting services um, surveys, we're able there to support you and maybe even act as a kind of a friendly surveyor going through your department the way that one of these accrediting bodies would do and kind of share with you maybe what some of your vulnerabilities are. Um, and really truly at the end of the day, we're, we're just people. Um, and so getting the chance to just know your IP or your SPD person on a personal level, I think is really super important. Um, so just connect with each other um, and, and really just start having a conversation and then that relationship can just really build. Um, and something I did want to focus on is, you know, as infection control, you know, we appreciate that each department that we work with has pressure points or pain points that you, that, you know, they have to kind of work through. So if there's issues with cleanliness, you know, we do have a relationship with every other department in the hospital. So if there's an issue with cleanliness, something needs to happen in SPD, you know, your local IP picks up the phone and talks to their friends in EVS and says, hey, you know, this is going on in SPD, can you come check it out or help? Same thing with facilities, if you need your counter laminated or you need help getting the chair replaced, um, you know, pick up your phone because your, SP, your, your IP people are also talking to facilities. Or we might be able to help, you know, provide that infection control um, reason about why that chair needs to be replaced. So we're also really there as an advocate to help reduce some of the barriers and pressure points that SPD, you know, kind of has to work through to provide that best patient care. 
And, and again, we love being helpful. Um, I did provide um, on my next slide just kind of some references um, for ARN, um, the Amy standards. I also shared um, two chapters from the infection control perspective that are written for infection preventionists to kind of help us learn about sterile processing, um, depending on which side you're in. Um, and then my last slide is just really just thanking you again for taking time to, um, to chat with me during my technology issues on a Saturday. And then I have a picture here of um, somebody in SPD that I was really able to collaborate with. So this is me in a bunny suit. Um, and again, kind of one of the consequences of me having spent time in sterile processing is when COVID hit and there was concerns about, you know, PPE, how do we sterilize things? You know, they felt comfortable picking up the phone and calling the infection control department. Um, when we were looking at reprocessing N95 masks, there was already, you know, a beautiful relationship um, that existed. So we were able to partner together. So you don't want to, you know, just necessarily partner with your infection control or your SPD team when something happens, but just recognizing that as we collectively, independently work in our roles, things will pop up or having the insight or knowledge of one will help support the other. Um, so, so thank you so much. And then I think we have a little bit of time for me to answer some questions. <clears throat> Yes, and that was such a great presentation. Uh, we do have quite a few questions and we've got a few minutes to run through uh, some of them. So one question is, can you speak a little bit to um, the dust that can be prevalent in sterile processing departments and what your impressions are with that? That's a great question. Um, so dust kind of exists in environments in general. And so when we're doing our rounding, you know, we're not looking for, you know, truly um, aseptic spaces like you would see in like those computer clean rooms. But really what we're looking for are patterns. So if you have a fine level of dust and it's the end of the day, you know, we appreciate that at the end of work day, you know, the, the SPD staff are gonna go ahead and decontaminate their workstation. But when you start seeing thicker levels of dust or you start seeing dust in places and thicker layers where you shouldn't see it, again, that really speaks to our overall effectiveness of our cleaning processes. So if it's an SPD kind of area that, S that SPD is responsible for, such as those workstations, then we would talk about, you know, kind of maybe we need to increase the frequency of the cleaning or make sure we get behind some of those bends. Um, if it's EVS responsibility, then we circle back to EVS and say, okay, you know, as part of your terminal clean, it doesn't look like we're hitting these places effectively. What do you need? What do we need to do to help you hit these places? And, and again, the intent there is that you want to reduce um, opportunities for pathogens to kind of become part of the environment. And the best way to do that is to keep the space clean because you're constantly removing them. So whether it's EVS or sterile processing who is doing the environment of care cleaning, what educational tools or um, or resources do you think are most beneficial for the professionals who are doing the cleaning? And then how frequent should environment of care cleaning be done? That's a really great question. Um, and I'm gonna kind of answer it in a couple different ways. Um, so first off, you know, infection control likes to talk a lot about wet contact time. Um, so when we're using disinfectants to disinfect a space, one thing that we want to make sure everybody knows is how long does that surface need to be wet before it's considered disinfected. So number one would be wet contact time. Um, but really kind of more broader than that, so again, kind of working towards that macroscopic view, is what dis is the disinfectant that you're using appropriate? So what is the disinfectant? Has the the staff member read the back of the bottle. Do we know what the wet contact time is? Um, and are they aware of kind of what that kill is? So does it kill just bacteria? Is it good on kind of some hardier organisms such as C. diff? Um, so there would be times where we'd use a kind of a disinfectant versus bleach. Do they know those? Um, more broadly is, you know, per Amy and ERO and standards, there's an expectation that sterile processing gets what's called a terminal clean done every day. Um, so is that terminal clean happening per those guidelines? Are we using the appropriate disinfectant? As far as how often you clean, so from an EVS perspective, it should be every day. 
um, from a sterile processing tech's perspective, what areas is your team responsible for? Are you aware of what those are? So frequently when infection control does rounds and we ask those questions of both the EVS and the SPD staff, what we find is sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about who's responsible for which particular horizontal space. Um, and I, you know, we're not necessarily going to clean something if it's somebody else's responsibility. So getting clarity on who cleans what I think is super important. And then lastly, you know, you clean it every day. And if you are seeing a spill or something happens immediately, you clean it. And if you find that there is kind of more dust or more debris than you would expect to be, then you would reevaluate your cleaning frequency. So maybe instead of cleaning the workstations, for example, once a night, maybe they need to happen with each shift. So there's kind of expectations on, you know, from a guideline perspective, um, but it's not black and white. So you have the ability to clean more frequently or as indicated. So we have time for just one more question. And this one is um, probably from an infection preventionist. Uh, how do you recommend navigating a department that's not very open to you being present in the department, despite trying to be as helpful and resourceful as possible? So I have personally run into that and it's super challenging. Um, and I feel like at the end of the day, we're still people. And so sometimes maybe they're not super open to our role, but can we appeal to them on a personal level? Um, so, you know, can we take them out for a cup of coffee? Um, can we, you know, offer to assist them with something? If there's a survey coming up, are we able to offer them to help a survey prep? So really, I think um, in some regards, it's knowing the, the love language, you will, of your coworkers, and really how do you get them to know you on a personal level so that they can start to trust you on a professional level. Thank you, Brenna, so much for such a great discussion and key infection prevention takeaways. Uh, if you well, thank have a question, if you have any additional questions that you'd like to ask Brenna, Feel free to reach out to her from her contact information located in the speaker bio section. We did have so many questions that we did not have time to get to. So uh, Brenna will reach out to you directly to answer those. Uh, there will be a short 15 minute break before the next session. Thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you soon for a discussion dedicated to gaps in healthcare collaboration. Thanks everyone.